The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. You're reading verses 1 through 6 there this morning. Isaiah chapter 60, beginning with verse 1, reading through verse 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away. Your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of the nation shall come to you, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come, and shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, as we come to hear a word from Holy Scripture, we pray to hear a word from you, a word that will change us, provoke us, call us, and empower us to be your people all the more. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. What do you call it? when it seems like God is out to get you? What do you call it when it feels like God is after you? Like the whole world seems to be just spinning towards your demise, towards your own end. What do you call that? I think if you had some time to think about it and you're honest, you'd probably just call it perception. After all, you can have a bad morning, bad string of mornings, miss the alarm, spill coffee all over your shirt, or what's worse for me, when you get to the bottom of the cup and there are grounds in it. You spill the coffee, you miss the alarm, the car won't start, you get to work late, you miss a meeting, you lose a client, you lose money, something. It just seems like when all these things line up together, it's easy to believe that maybe, just maybe, God is out to get you. But really, that's just a string of unfortunate accidents we might more rightly call, I don't know, bad luck, horrible coincidence. So what do you call it when God is really out to get you? I mean, what do you do when someone with a religious title like, I don't know, prophet, tells you that God is out to get you, to put an end to you? What do you call that? Honestly, the only word that I can think is hopeless. If God has really made a point to bring about your end, do you have any hope? It's hopeless. Can it be anything else? And I have to imagine that's how the people of Judah must have felt hearing words from prophets like Elijah. God's judgment is coming. You messed up. God is bringing Babylon to take you all away. God is out to get you. They failed to hold up their end of the covenant that God had made with their ancestor to be a blessing to the nations. And now God was going to send this foreign power to destroy them, to cart them off into a strange land, to desecrate their temple, to pillage their wealth, to separate their families, to be just all destroyed. God was out to get them. I'd call that hopeless, wouldn't you? And I suppose it must have felt that way. The prophet Ezekiel says they sat by the rivers in Babylon. 
They weren't fishing, just sitting by the rivers. I suppose it must have felt that way to sit in exile in Babylon, knowing that it was the hand of God Almighty that had put you there. And it didn't really seem like there was any way out of it. You could call it hopeless. Some folks might call it rock bottom. Either way, it's certainly dark. Maybe you haven't been there, but it can be a terribly dark place. Rock bottom. Hopeless. A place where the only true escape seems to be the cold embrace of the grave. And whenever you're there, there's always somebody hanging around trying to talk you up out of the hole, waiting for you to walk out the door of your own despair to tell you how you should have said it right, to shake a little sugar on the bitter pill that you have to swallow. They say things like, when you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere to go but where? Up. They say things like, well, when you've lost everything, well, you've got nothing left to lose. Or maybe one of my favorites. Well, you know, it's always darkest just before the dawn. Now, why couldn't the prophets say that sort of stuff? I suppose those may have been welcome words to the people in exile, the people of Judah as they sat there in Babylon. Can't you picture it? Isaiah climbing up on a stump somewhere, holding his hands up aloft. Hey, everybody, everybody, I know you've been scattered from homes, from families, all you've ever known in the world, but don't worry, it's always darkest before the dawn. Man, can you imagine? I bet some of those folks would have, oh, thank God. I'm glad the prophet said that. But I kind of doubt it. I mean, when you're in that place, that dark place where it feels like you can sink no lower, that place when the darkness seems to be pulling you in deeper and deeper, when you're in that place, you just want to smack those people. That bumper sticker theology isn't going to do much to pull you out. Especially, especially when you say it's always darkest before the dawn and the dawn comes and the day is just as messed up as the one before. When the world still isn't set right and it still feels as if God is out to get you. That's when you find that there may actually be a deeper darkness even after the dawn. You see, these people of Judah to whom the prophet Isaiah is speaking were eventually freed from Babylon, eventually set loose. They were able to return back to Jerusalem after their exile. You can read the stories about it in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Our English Bible separated them, but the Hebrew keeps them together. It tells the stories of the people's return to Jerusalem how King Cyrus of Persia said, y'all go back, build a wall around the city, build your temple back, you can have it all back. Go back to Jerusalem. The darkness was over. The day had dawned. When their eyes adjusted to the light, though, they found them full of tears of mourning, shame and despair for sometimes. The deeper darkness comes after our failures, after we've hit rock bottom, after the dawn. Because sometimes the deeper disappointment is found when our expectations are met by disappointment. The scribe Ezra recounts it this way in the third chapter. He talks about what happens when the people came back, when they were let loose and come back to Jerusalem. He said, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Yahweh, the priest in their vestments with trumpets, the Levites with cymbals, the marching band is out, folks. Here they are. They took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by the King David. And with praise and thanksgiving, they sang a new song to Yahweh. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. I mean, they're having a party. There's joy. They're excited. The temple foundation has been relayed. 
And all the people gave a great shout to praise the Lord because the foundation of the Lord was laid. But then Ezra says this, But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid. While many others shouted for joy. They don't weep like the mother who watches her daughter walk across the graduation stage. They don't weep like the one in the maternity ward holding their grandchild for the first time. They weep like those who've gone away from home for so long to come back and find the shutters hanging, the windows broken, and the kitchen floor falling in. The people who could remember what it had once been, those who were expecting the former glory of Solomon's temple, well, wept so loudly at the pitiful sight of this new temple that their weeping was mingled in with the shouts of joy from all the young people. And it couldn't be distinguished. In times like that, disappointment can seem deeper and darker still. Not unlike the father, with more mouths to feed and fewer hours at work, who goes into the convenience store, spends his last few dollars on a Powerball ticket. He had to go across the state line, you know. And he waits in front of the television at night, waiting to hear the numbers, prays, He's prayed, he's crossed his fingers, he's out of ideas, he's out of money, he's out of time. And for a moment, it all seems possible. It all seems like all of his hopes and dreams would come true, like he's holding that winning ticket in his hand to go from desperate to unbelievably rich in a matter of seconds. From scrimping and saving for spam and eggs to steak and shrimp at every meal. It's right there in his hands. That drafty apartment fades into a distant memory along with that stack of pink envelopes and cut-off notices on the counter. But as soon as they call the first number, his heart sinks through the floor because he doesn't have the first one right. (laughs) In times like that, disappointment can be a deeper darkness. In times like that, hope evaporates. The light mocks you. It doesn't show you what's good. It blinds your eyes. And you begin to doubt whether you should have ever left that which you came out of. I mean, yeah, that was hard. Yeah, it was dark. Yeah, Babylon wasn't home. But at least there we could dream. At least there we still had the hope. At least there we could still imagine that one day it'd be all set right. But now here we are, and it's this? One day I'd hoped to be here, but now I'm this old, and it's this? I dreamed one day I'd live in a mansion. I'd do this. I dreamed one day I'd go here. And now here I am with more years behind me than years ahead of me. And it's this. It's this. Sure, at least back then it was hard. It may have been painful. But at least, at least there was the dream. At least there was hope. And so the people of Judah wept in the midst (laughs) of their disappointment when they saw that they couldn't go backwards. When they realized that the dawn only brought with it the uncovering of their shortcomings, they wept. For when they were freed from the darkness of exile, they found the deeper darkness of disappointment. And what may be the deepest darkness of all, the realization that they couldn't pull themselves out of it alone. The prophet speaks about this darkness in the verses before this morning. It's epiphany. We, we want to run to the light, but you can't come out in the light without having known that you were in the darkness. And so the prophet says in chapter 59, singing on behalf of the people, The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. The roads they have made crooked, no one walks in them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. And then the prophet sings, we wait for light, but behold, there is darkness for brightness, but we walk in gloom. 
In other words, the prophet, on behalf of the people, is issuing a confession, a realization. This darkness, this Babylon that we're in is a result of their own ignorance towards peace and justice. The people of Judah are in darkness because they've not upheld their end of God's covenant to bless the nations, to live for peace and justice. The darkness is of their own making, but they can't undo it. Not on their own. And that is perhaps the deepest darkness. The realization that we are the cause, yet completely incapable of being the cure at least on our own. And that, I think, more than anything, seems to be the ironic hurdle so many of us who call ourselves people of faith have a hard time to clear. Yeah, we confess it's by grace through faith alone. I mean, it's almost a slogan. It is a slogan. It's printed on the sign of some folks' church. By grace through faith alone. But still... Still, so many of us hang on to the notion that that is something we can do. Something we control. Something for which we are inevitably responsible. It's why we tend to gravitate towards religious ideas that seem like easy to follow step-by-step instructions. It's why we like absolutist religion. With no room for unanswered questions, for doubt, for contradiction, or mystery. If our faith has handles on it, that's good. If it's got clear lines, steps to follow, boundaries that separate those who are right from those who still have to come around to being right, then maybe, maybe just maybe, it's something we can do ourselves. And then faith becomes a matter of just confession, a matter of agreement, a matter of aligning oneself with the correct ideas, people, and action, because those are things we can do for ourselves. We can bring ourselves out of the darkness, we think. But friends, do I even need to tell you? Do I even need to tell you? Maybe you've already discovered it for yourself. Maybe you're still in that dark place of denial. But do I even need to tell you that the truth is, no matter how hard we strive to do it, No matter how much we pray, no matter how much we read, no matter how much we study or act or confess, you and I are incapable of pulling ourselves out of the darkness we create. Because when we try, we find only disappointment. Weeping in the shadow of what we had hoped would be. When we try, we discover that there's always, well, I could have done a little bit more and made it a little bit better. I could have gone a little bit farther. I could have spent a little more time, and I'm still not quite there. And when we try to do it ourselves, we always come up short. Because so long as we are trying to do it by ourselves, there is that nagging, ever-present sin at the root of all other sin. Self. And I think the people of Judah came to that realization in the shadow of their own disappointment in Jerusalem. So the prophet of God speaks to them. There they are weeping. This isn't what we had hoped. This isn't what we thought we were going to get. This is terrible. Weeping in the darkness of their own disappointment. And so the prophet speaks not words of, well, it'll get better. Well, just try a little harder. Well, just pray a little more. Read your Bible a little more. Maybe y'all should give a little more money. Build a temple up a little bit more. It's not what he says. God, the prophet says, is coming into this. You don't have to do it on your own. The prophet speaks of God's own intervention, of God's arrival into the world to bring the people out of their self-made darkness, to shine the true light so that all of God's people, every last one of them, Male and female, Jew and Gentile, they come from across the oceans, the prophet says. So that they may come to the light to be delivered from all of our self-imposed darkness. And he does it with an imperative. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Get up. 
Shine. You're not shining from yourself. Your light has come. God has intervened in the world. The prophet proclaims to a people who seem to be totally lost in the dark, in their own dark, that the light of God, the very presence of God, has come into the world. God's presence. Christ's presence. The Spirit's presence. It means you and I, no matter how much we run, no matter how deep down into the darkness we may go, you and I are never there alone. That God's presence is always there. That we don't have to pull ourselves out from our own self-made darkness. That the light of God has come to set us free. To liberate us from the darkness of hopelessness to drag us out of the deeper darkness of our own disappointments and to bring us in to the light of God's eternal loving presence. So whatever darkness you make for yourself, whatever darkness you think the world has heaped upon you, arise, shine, for your light has come. And its name is God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come now in the light of your presence, Call us out of whatever darkness may be around us. Whatever that thing that may have a hold on us that renders us hopeless at times, Lord, call us into deliverance, into freedom, and into the light of your salvation. Lord Jesus, call us out of our darkness and into your light. And give us, Lord, the courage to come. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.